Now we have a, it's my next uh, sp splendid pleasure to introduce uh, Don Myrex, who will speak about the grand challenge, secure cyberspace. Uh, with experiences both in industry and government, she has extensive um, uh, ex expertise uh, on this subject and actually was named of, of uh, one of Fortune F Magazine's uh, top 100 intellectual leaders in the world. It's really a truly honor to have uh, Don Myrix here today for, uh, to speak to us. So Don, the floor is now yours. Good afternoon, thank you very much for the invitation. Congratulations to the new members. It is my great pleasure to be here today. Um, I thought I would start, I was a undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon and I, got, I had the opportunity to be a, a student of Dr. Herb Simon. And that also included the fact that I got to feed his laboratory rats. I'm not making that up. But uh, for those of you that are familiar with his work, I thought I would start with a quote that he put together that I think is very relevant. The institutions of the society must share with the professional the redefinition of the goals of design. And I think the grand challenge that the Academy has put together is really in that space of redefining the goals of the design. Because I think we started this as a technological challenge and where we are in terms of the society is a much more robust conversation that must happen that merges all of the disciplines. And I think Bob talked about why this is so important. Uh, imagine the, the attack surface of a medical device that's implanted to administer medicine, for example. So I wanted to talk about that and how we're approaching it in the uh, intelligence community, but we're gonna start kind of cosmically at first. So if you look at the role of government in terms of investment, um, generally, so far, the big investments for cyberspace and cyber, secure cyberspace have been largely trained by the government, right? And I have to tell a story here because I, just, I think it's, very, it's a great illustration of why I think we have to change our thinking about that to some extent. So when I ran product technology at AOL, which was one of the things that I did in the mid-2000 uh, timeframe, we would have one in seven accounts compromised. And those accounts would be compromised to the tune of somewhere between 50 and $70,000. So we would issue RSA fobs for free with the idea that the individual could now protect their account by entering a digit, set of digits that were randomly changed every minute in addition to their password and their username. How long did it take before nobody was using that code anymore? on average. Uh, 24 hours is a good guess. We got to zero in six months, even when the individual had been compromised to the tune of $50,000. So the lesson there is that an individual will give up their privacy for convenience every single time. How many here bank online? Alrighty then, okay. <laughs> and you all know better, so, right? So I think what we've done is we've tried to attack, attack, attack a, a problem that is societal in, in many of its aspects with pure technology with kind of the results that we would, find, would, would expect, right? I will also say that the goals, redefining goals, I wanna use the timed example just so we can think about the context for this next slide that I have up. So in the late 50s, the Russians put together a huge air force, and an intercontinental ballistic missile program. How many people here knew that from the time the U-2 flew over Russia, they had radar signatures on it on the first flight and maintained custody throughout that flight? This is unclassified information. True. Why didn't they do anything about it? They couldn't reach it, right? So the government, the USG said, wow, this isn't working out exactly like we needed to. We don't really understand what they're up to. And they started, that was the basis for the corona program. What most people don't know is that started in 1956 timeframe. So what catalyzed the transition from airborne to space? Anybody remember Gary Powers, 1960? Okay, good. How many attempts were there 
to collect from space before he got shot down? 10. And every single one of them failed. Only seven got to orbit. And the only time they ever recovered a, field, uh, a film canister was because the range safety officer detonated the rocket because it started to fishtail. And so they jumped in a Jeep and drove a mile away from the, the <laughs> launch pad and picked it up. I'm not kidding. <laughs> right? So imagine a government investment that failed 10 times in living Technicolor today. How long would that program live? Oh, by the way, it took them 13 before they actually got it right. And the good news was Gary Powers went down in May. The 13th happened in August of, that of 1960. Nobody knows about all the time that happened, that all of the failures, well, nobody remembers. People know about it, but nobody remembers. So this is why I think what you've done is so important in terms of the cybersecurity goals that you've articulated, right? Because redefining the goals in light of what society can view and stand is really key to making progress against this challenge. Because there's no longer a tolerance that the government will take, in this case four years wasn't a bad time frame given what we do in space today, but have 12 failures. No one would tolerate that, right? But SpaceX can try out outrageous things like trying to, to land part of their system on a pad to recover it to keep their costs down, and they can miss and they keep going. So the calculus has changed, and the fact that you all have reposed that, I think, is fabulous, and that it has a global impact, not just a local one. The fact that people actually are part of the equation, that governments, that institutions are part of the equation that must be considered for us to do something substantive with respect to cyberspace is absolutely essential, and a good systems of systems approach, which we all believe in, what we haven't done, and I don't think, is include the economic drivers. I read articles that say, well, if we treated it like the nuclear community, this would be okay, right? We know how to do that. How many people have access to nuclear submarines? And mourning the days when the government was the big investor in R&D, yeah, we can all do that. Does it change anything? So I think part of what you've done is you've taken that conversation and you've re-wickered it. And that is a reflection of the societal norms and the realities of the world that we live in. And it is absolutely essential that that be done on an international level, not just on a national level. So I'm going to start now with these national charts that I have thrown up here. So if you look at this, and they're probably a little bit hard to read, but you can see that over time, industry has done more and more of what is classified as R&D. And it's really applied R&D, and I get that, right? But they do more to bring things to market in two to five years in terms of investment than the government can hope to do. And they can also tolerate the risks that the government cannot bear. If we had two things blow up on launch pads back to back, or fail in some sense, NASA would be completely stood down until they did a red team for, what, 18, 24 months? So the calculus, the risk calculus has changed, the risk environment has changed, and we must partner in order to be effective in addressing this. So let me keep going. Here's a worrisome trend if you only scope this to government, expense, uh, government investments, right? I think the chart speaks for itself. If we don't leverage the capital in our own system, in our own economy, and think about partners' economies as well, we cannot maintain the kinds of technical edges that we need particularly as it, as it corresponds to cyberspace, and cyberspace is everywhere. You just heard Bob talk about it. Here's a hype cycle. Um, I only put that up really to give context to, so what we think about, let me say, in the, what I think we should be thinking about in terms of where the government makes investments is in the 15 to 20 years for NIH or closer in. We in the IC tend to not do much real um, early science. We do a lot of applied science. Because believe it or not, the current administration is more interested generally in what's going on in two to five years than they are for longer terms. Not a shocker for people in this town. But we must think about overtly how we leverage our industry partners and our international partners in order to address the areas that we are expected to maintain capability in, real leadership. 
And everybody knows that in 2030, we'll have enough computation on a single chip to replicate a human brain. Um, so we, we have to ride these curves. We must, absolutely, we must ride the, these curves. And I'm encouraged, be, encouraged, again, because the National Academy is saying, OK, how do we characterize? How do we authenticate hardware and software? And I'm not sure we, authentication is the answer, I think characterization. We know how to do A sub O calculations based on systems that are not inherently reliable. And I think that's how we have to start thinking about these problems. But I also think we have to take into account the fact that an individual is not going to, even when they're compromised, enter five extra digits in order to ensure that they are protected. So this is part of the design that we must address and the balance that we must address as a society and as a nation moving forward. The Internet of Things, $1.9 trillion. Bob talked about a few of those. When you think about your power systems, um, the city lights, anything that comes to mind, but there's a continuum here, right? I'm used to control alt delete on some classes of computers. I don't want to do that with my pacemaker or being one of those women in the range of the osteoporosis study that Bob mentioned, right? I probably don't want to inject myself every day either. So thinking about the user experience and how that works in and how we leverage things from an economic standpoint so that it's not all on the government, so that we engage at the right places, I think is really, really important. And I think the conversation that you've engendered is absolutely essential to that. Big data analytics, $18 billion business growing, right? And moving to mobile. What are the opportunities there? I think another thing, having been a, a student of Dr. Simon, that he said that was really, really insightful a long time ago, even the third edition is 1996, I noticed today when I was looking at it, was that it's not about information distribution. It's really about information presentation, because it's a fight for attention. Because we're all overwhelmed, there's a plethora of data. What of it matters? Think about how your eyes work, how your nose works, how your ears work. Right? All of that is kind of background processing in terms of higher order functions. And it's because of the wonderful capability of the brain to throw away lots of information because it knows what's important. That's how we need to think about this problem. And we need to think about it from a multidisciplinary approach. So how is the IC thinking about this? And I think the, the message here is that the specifics don't matter so much. It's that we all have to take our positions and we all have to advance the art and the engineering and the science and the design in tandem or we will not adequately address the challenges that are before us. And I think you're uniquely positioned to help those conversations. So I'll go through these. And, and the message is that we've decided where it is that we can play, but we need to do this in tandem of a much larger policy framework of which the US is not the only player. And I love the fact that you're doing things in China and India and other places because I think that matters a lot. So here are the offices that are within IARPA. You can see that all of them have something to do with secure cyberspace. But the thing I'm very proud of is that it also includes the very real human attributes of how we make a difference. So for example, one of the things that we've funded is we've created control groups that work on the president's daily brief for six verticals that are composed entirely of experts, external experts, that help advise how a market will perform in whatever vertical. And we use them in parallel with the folks that have the special sauce inside the organization. And what we've discovered, the good news is, is that intelligence does make addition, a difference in five of six of those verticals that we look at. I'm not going to tell you which one it doesn't matter in. We will write checks there instead. You could probably guess if you think about it. That's good news because, as you know, the ability to make a decision in a shorter period of time often gives operational advantage. But I'm very proud of the fact that we're actually taking the human element into account. And in that particular case, the framework of how they collaborate on a worldwide scale is sec much secondary to the level of expertise that we bring to the problem. 
right? And this isn't crowdsourcing, this isn't Wikipedia, this is vetted experts who then grade each other on how well they do against a particular problem set. So intelligence can make a difference, but it also illustrates that you can have really, really good intelligence insights without any classified information. And that's the, the world that we are going to be facing more and more as we move forward. InQtel is another way for us to engage with industry. Um, that's a VC that uh, we have in place that does investments because we want to be lead users. We want to influence the market so that it actually addresses the problems that confront us. And because the, of the economic engine that the United States economy represents, what it can bring to bear, these are the curves we believe we have to ride in order to stay relevant well into the future. But it's not just riding them, we have to, to the extent we can, shape those curves. And here are the investments that we're making. In, in some cases, we actually put together labs where the IP belongs to the companies that participate, not the government. But it brings home very, very quickly what it is that we need. And very often, I will tell you that we are lead in the market. We think about things differently. That is one of the big advantages of including the government in the conversation. Now, I'm not saying NIH is doing wonderful work, right? We need them to continue to spend their money, and they need to do that basic science that, and make those long-term commitments. I'm simply saying we need to come up with a framework where we can play our positions and, and thus move everybody forward. And in our particular case, because our R&D budgets are small in the intelligence community, we know what we need to do. We need to partner for capacity and continue to maintain lead capability. And it's these kinds of different ways of partnering that are absolutely essential to moving forward, much in line with what Dr. Simon recommended in terms of how we redefine the goals the society, or the, and include the societal goals in order to have a mark that says this is goodness. This is what we are trying to achieve as a society, as a world. So the role of the USG, at least for now, from an IC perspective, is, but also broad, more broadly, is we need to do the basic science. That's going to be done by people other than us, generally. There are some exemptions. We're very interested, for example, in quantum information um, systems with the agency and in the IC. But we also, and this is work based on the work of Eric von Hippel, we need to be lead users. We need to be out there influencing. I'll give you one more stat just to say, and it's not just the US. Of the 70 principal investigators that IARPA has working quantum computing, only seven are US citizens. Now, maybe Dan will have some ideas about how to address that. But I would submit that this is the world as it is, not the world as we would necessarily like it to be. And for that reason, we must bring these kinds of sensibilities to addressing the challenges on the scale of secure cyberspace. And I'm gratified that the National Academy has taken this stance because I think it is no less than the existence of the planet over the next few years. So I, I will leave you with two thoughts. One, that this is a team sport. And if we do not address the economic and commercial pieces of these problems, then we will not address the challenges themselves. And the second is, are we appropriately engaged to inform these conversations and to catalyze the kinds of discussions that are absolutely necessary? We can mourn the days of corona. We can mourn the days that, that the US government drove R&D. We can do all of those things. It doesn't change what is in front of us from a societal perspective. And with that, I'll thank you again for the time. Well, Don, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I'm, I'm, still left, I'm still left with the question, though. Is it possible to secure cyberspace? No, it said no. Okay.